Hey everyone and welcome. I am so honored that you have tuned in with us today. If you're joining us, it's because we believe that God has a reason for you to be here and we are so grateful. I'm Angie Larson and I get to serve as the executive minister here at Calvary and we are in the middle of our series, Beyond the Post. I believe that there's always something behind the ways that people act, behind their post on social media or behind their letter to the editor. And I think that we are living in a time where more people, more and more people are burned out and burdened than ever before in our lifetimes. If you're someone who is burned out or you're feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders, then this message today is for you. It's about how God leads us through our burnouts and leads us through our burdens and into something new, into bravery. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey folks, Pastor Hans here, and if this is your first time with us, we're so glad you're with us. In fact, we pray, we pray today that today is not your last time with us. We're in the midst of a worship series that we're calling Beyond the Post. And here's what you and I know. Over the last eight months, over this last year, we've all experienced a bit a bit of isolation. And here's what we believe. We believe that our isolation it's done something to our toleration. Our isolation has affected our toleration, and I don't have to tell you that because you know it. You see it in those social media posts that sort of make your blood boil, that letter to the editor you read just the other day, or maybe it was in that rant that that neighbor or family member, when they went off about who knows what, and it made your blood boil. As Christians, what if God is inviting us, inviting us to go beyond the post, to look beyond that letter to the editor that got under our skin, to, to go beyond that rant, that unsolicited rant, and see in that person a child of God. I know it's hard, but today Angie is gonna invite us to go beyond the post and to see that in that person who posted whatever they posted, that, that letter to the editor beyond that unsolicited rant, well, there's a story. There's a child of God with a story. Well, folks, again, thanks for tuning in today. And before we begin, would you do two things for me? Would you help us get the word out? Likely you know somebody who needs a message of hope in these times where we seem so intolerant of one another. Would you share this post? Would you like it? If you're watching on YouTube, hit that little bell so you get notifications. Subscribe to our channel. And if you're watching on Cable Access 1 in 81, invite a friend to watch next week. The second thing you could do for us is this, stick around after worship because we have, first off, two really exciting announcements about some ways that we're going to help you and your family get ready for Christmas. The first is a student event that's coming on November 22nd, and the second is a special Christmas night of worship coming up on December Fourth. And last but certainly not least, we have a super exciting announcement about a way that Calvary is going to partner with other churches around us and a special award that Calvary receives. So stick around. Folks, let's worship.
So what do burdens and burnout have to do with bravery? When I was in my 20s, I was serving a church where there was this family that I really, really admired. The mom, she was tall and thin with beautiful hair that was always exactly in the right place. I'm not sure exactly what she did, but I know she worked at a prestigious bank in town. And her husband, he was always put together, and I knew that he worked at a lawyer at a really classy law firm. You see, this couple, they had four children, three girls and a boy, and they would show up at 8.50 for 9 a.m. church with coordinating outfits and their hair all done just perfectly. They'd walk in and they'd sit in the second row and they were so incredibly well behaved. To be honest, I was jealous of them. I admired them. I wondered how they did it. I mean, my kids would be sitting there too, poking each other, and I would just feel lucky if their clothes matched their own clothes, let alone their siblings' clothes. But this family, I was, I was intimidated by them completely. They seem to have it all together. We have these images of people, don't we? As people, we tend to be naturally curious about other people, and then we compare ourselves to them. I mean, think about it. Every time you're at a store and you're checking out, there's the opportunity for just that, to compare yourself. To compare yourself to celebrities, to workout gurus, to royalty and politicians. But we don't actually have to go to the store to be able to do that. We can do that from the comfort of our own hands, scrolling through photos over Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook getting glimpses, little snapshots or six second videos into people's lives and comparing our life to them. We read comments that they have to say and then we compare them to the comments that we might wanna make and then we have to decide if literally we're going to like or love them or not. Now I'll be honest, me too. I, I really want you to like or love this message too. You see, curiosity and comparison are built into who we are as people because we wanna see if what we are experiencing, if what we are going through is normal or okay, or maybe if there's something that we should work on. My girlfriend used to say, every small town needs a drunk. And what she meant by it was that we all want to compare ourselves so that at least we can say to ourselves, I mean, I have my problems, but that's nothing compared to what Bob's got going on. Or I have my issues, but they are so tiny compared to what Jenny's got going on in her life. In this way, we can then justify our own behavior because you know, at least it's not as bad as theirs. But I have conversation after conversation with people these days and I'm hearing the same thing over and over again. They say to me, Angie, I am just burnt out. I am so tired of this. Most people that I know are just over 2020. <laughs> are you over 2020? We're tired of COVID. We're tired of politics. We're tired of arguments and social media, and we're tired of restrictions, and we're tired, if I may be so bold, to say we are burnt out. Extra crispy fried burnt out completely. Burned out of all the things that are going on in our families, that are going on in our country, and going on in our world. And not only do we have the regular stresses of this life, like paying bills and caring for our kids and our parents, but we've had this whole added year of stressors, of additional stressors that have taken our energy and our brain space and depleted it, leaving us just with nothing left. The term burnout, it actually comes from rocket science. When a rocket gets shot into space, at some point it runs out of fuel, or it runs out of energy, and then the rocket, it falls back down to the earth. When we run out of energy, the same thing happens to us. We get tired and cynical. We lose patience and grow apathetic towards other people. We lose tolerance and empathy. And when we're burnt out, we are more likely to just take it out on someone else, probably the people closest to us, to say, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and post this political comment, or I'm just gonna go ahead and write this letter to the editor. I'm gonna just let them have it. Friends, has 2020 left you feeling this way? left you feeling like you have nothing left to give, left you feeling dry and depleted and completely out of energy, when you can't even just sort of muster up any extra energy to just deal with people. 
I mean, we know that burnout affects our relationships. We know that it affects our health and it affects our jobs. Burnout happens when life fails to meet our expectations. When teaching has lost its joy, when healthcare work becomes a burden, when parenting is a chore, when, sig when civil engagement is just aggravating, when we are burned out and we have nothing left for the people that are around us. My son Sawyer, when he was born, he was born with a birth defect that led him to have surgery right after his birth. My husband and I, we spent six weeks in the neonatal intensive care unit in order to get him healthy enough to go home. But when we went home, I'll be honest, he still wasn't nearly 100%. He was, he was still really small for almost two months old, under six pounds, and he still had a lot of health issues. Uh, one of those health issues that he had was that he contracted C. diff in the hospital, which is an intestinal imbalance. This required him to have this heavy-duty antibiotic every four hours, and you had to be really exact on the time that you were to give it to him. And on top of this, he had to consume extra calories to make up for all the time that he had lost in the hospital, so we had to almost force feed him about every two hours. On top of that, we had two other kids at home that were 10 and 6, and my husband was in grad school, and I had to go back to work so that we could continue our health insurance. So we, we weren't sleeping any more than, than maybe two hours at a time, and this had gone on for months and months, and my husband and I, we were burnt out, and we were exhausted. One day after work, I went to pick up his antibiotics at the local pharmacy, and then I picked up my other kids, and I went home, and I made dinner, and I got everyone bathed, and I got them all ready for bed, and then I went to the refrigerator so I could get the syringes of antibiotics all ready and labeled for the night. And as I went through the medicine, I realized that there wasn't enough, that we were shorted and that he wouldn't get one of his needed doses. But I knew that the pharmacy was still open, so my husband stayed with the kids and I went back to the pharmacy. The same pharmacist was there when I showed up and I marched up to that counter and I am ashamed to admit it to you, I marched up to that counter and I chewed her out. I asked her why she shorted me the medicine that my sick infant needed, and I threatened to call the Better Business Bureau on the whole establishment. I demanded that she give me what I paid for, and if this was today, I'm sure I would have gotten out my phone and written a one-star Yelp or Google review. And, and this poor young woman, this poor pharmacist, she was kind to me, even though I wasn't in any way kind to her. And she said to me kindly, there's nothing else that I can do tonight. You'll need to get another prescription for your doctor. And so in the most uh, passive aggressive voice that I could ma ever muster, I said to her, well then, I guess my baby isn't going to get his life-saving medicine tonight. It was not my finest moment. Now I've given you the whole picture. The, the big picture of what was going on in my life at the time. Sick baby, busy family, sleep deprivation. And maybe because you have that whole picture, you can see in me some level of compassion and empathy. But in my interaction with the pharmacist, it was just a part, a really, really small part, just a snapshot, just a glimpse. She didn't know what I was going through, and honestly, I didn't know what she was going through either. I don't know what my words could have done to her, and I had no idea what burdens she was carrying that I added to that day. As I pulled into my driveway at home without this medicine, just after chewing out this poor, kind pharmacist, I just laid my head on the steering wheel and I wept. And I wept and I wept and I cried and I cried. But it was from that steering wheel on the head angle that I could see down on the floor of my car the second bottle of the same medicine that she had given to me earlier that day on the floor. You see, it had fallen out of the bag. And I thought that there was only one bottle, but there had been two. There was more than enough for my son. And I was deeply ashamed over how I treated this sweet, kind pharmacist. In the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 4, there's a woman who is empty and burnt out and burdened. And the story goes like this. Jesus is traveling with his disciples, and they are going through Judea and 
Galilee, and this route from Judea to Galilee, it has to go through this area called Samaria. Now, Samaritans and Jews, well, they don't get along. They are seen as just the worst to each other. They called each other dogs. You see, Jews and Samaritans, they didn't even bother crossing the aisle and interacting, and they had vastly different opinions on things. Does this remind you of anyone else these days? Maybe Democrats and Republicans? But anyway, Jesus, a Jew, decides to go through Samaria. Most people would have gone around, but but not Jesus. And the Bible says this. So Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, as tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Here's Jesus in a foreign land, one that hates him, and he is all alone. And he's tired, and he's in the hottest part of the day, because it is noon. When all of a sudden, a woman comes up to the same well, and this woman, she is burdened and burnt out. And and we know this because historically you would go and collect water in the morning or in the early evening because the heat of the noonday sun would be just extra exhausting. And you see, at this time, gathering water was seen as a social experience like it is in many countries today. You go and you gather water with the other women to chat and to catch up. But here's this Samaritan woman. She's out there all alone at the heat of the day, at noon. Because you see these other women, they've made assumptions about her. They've formed their opinions. The Samaritan woman, she's been married five times, and the man that she's with now is not her husband. Oftentimes, if you've heard this story before, you hear how she gets portrayed as a promiscuous or scandalous woman by preachers, as a woman with a reputation. But more than likely, she's been from husband to husband to husband because she is barren. In this society, her value is not based on anything other than whether she can have children. And it's her husband's right to leave her if she doesn't. So she's been victimized by no fault of her own. And she's been given this label of being bad luck. So she avoids the other women. She doesn't need their ridicule or their stress. She doesn't need their questions or their judgment. It's just better at this point. She's the person that they all compare themselves to. The, at least I'm not her, she can't have children. You see, this woman, she is struggling. I'm sure she'd rather not have to gather water at all, but she is literally and figuratively carrying a heavy burden a heavy jar to collect water, and an emotional burden to go with it, both burden and burnout. And you can guess that the last thing she expected to happen was for her to run into a Jewish rabbi named Jesus sitting by himself on the side of the well. And he, he has the nerve to ask her for a drink. The Samaritan woman, she does something bold. She talks back to this guy, both a foreigner and a man, and she replies to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus and the Samaritan woman, they continue their conversation, and it's a long chapter. It's the whole of her story. He, the whole explanation comes out, not just a little tiny snapshot, not just an assumption, not just a scroll through or an opinion piece. Jesus gets to know her, and Jesus gets to know her story. And she, she gets to know his as well. 
President Abraham Lincoln once said, I don't like that man. I need to get to know him better. You see, I watched this beautiful, successful family at church for years. I made assumptions about them and I judged them on their perfecty perfectness. <laughs> Until one day at a Bible study, I finally had an in-depth conversation with the beautiful, successful mom. And in our conversation, she cried. She cried and she shared with me the tragedy of her childhood, how she had lost two of her three siblings before they turned 18, and then her parents ended up in a terrible, terrible divorce while she was in college. And I listened and I cried with her, and I thought, I'll take messy hair over that any day. Because you see, everyone, even the perfect -y perfect everyone's got their stuff. There is always, always more to the story. There is always more to the post. There is always more to the letter to the editor. Ian McLaren writes, be kind because everyone you meet is carrying a heavy burden. See, the Samaritan woman, she gets to know Jesus and she gets to see how Jesus sees her. And because of this interaction, she's changed. Her, her burden is somehow refreshed and her emotional dryness is quenched. She is no longer extra crispy fried. Instead, through her encounter with Jesus, this Samaritan woman is filled up with his living water, with grace and good news as she realizes that Jesus knows her, that Jesus sees her, and that Jesus loves her no matter what then something remarkable happens. Then the story continues. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She leaves her water jar. She leaves this burden that she has been carrying, this weight that she brought with her out into the heat of the day, all those pains, all that stigma. She leaves her burden there at the well with Jesus. Because of this leaving this burden there with the well with Jesus, she gets to move forward with bravery. She gets to move forward with bravery right into the very community that rejected her, the community that judged her, the community that victimized her, because she wants to tell them about Jesus. Friends, what burnouts and burdens are you carrying? What is weighing you down today? You see, I think we're all like the Samaritan woman, burdened and burned out. We have to deal with it or we'll end up comparing ourselves to an unrealistic snapshot of someone's life or we'll end up taking it out on our kids or our spouse or our coworkers or some poor pharmacist. Jesus comes to us over and over and over and Jesus says to us, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. He takes your extra crispy places and he rehydrates them over and over again. He takes your burnout and he refuels you for another day. He takes your burdens and he says, leave them here with me. Jesus does this for us over and over again. You see, we have a God that says to you, you feel like you can't get through this? Let's get through this together. You feel like you don't have enough? I am a God of abundance. You feel like you're not worthy? Let me remind you how worthy you are. You feel like you don't have the patience for them? I'm going to bring you patience. You feel like you're all alone? I will always be with you. You feel ashamed? You are forgiven. You feel empty. Let me refuel you. And when we are refueled, when we are refreshed, when we are unburdened, it is only then that we can go and love our neighbor. When we can see them as a child of God, as someone going through the same stuff that we are. And it takes bravery to see your neighbor as a child of God. It takes bravery to listen to others about what they have experienced, even when we're not so sure about them. It takes bravery to change our minds Mind about people we have previously judged and it takes bravery a bravery like the Samaritan woman has to love others even when they have rejected us even when they drive us crazy with their politics and positions it takes bravery to be curious about their experience instead of just judging them and comparing ourselves to them so friends for today let go of your burnout God will refuel you 
Let go of your burdens. Just leave them there at Jesus' feet and walk with bravery. Go and love your neighbor as yourself, as a beloved child of God. Please pray with me. God, we come to you burnt out and burdened. You know how much is going on in our lives and in our world, and we bring to you our weary souls. God, refresh us with your promises. Quench our thirst in your grace. Take our burdens off our backs and our hearts. Remind us today and every day that you are living water. You are an abundant supply of grace and love. And help us to walk bravely in the world so that we can lead all people to a lifelong faith in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shore. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me
Since I met you, I am changed. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me in the grave. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye, say goodbye to my yesterdays. 
changed ever since I met you. I am changed. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Let's end today with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Folks, thanks again for tuning in today. If you're someone new to Calvary, we'd love to help get you connected with all that's going on here at the church. You can do that by heading out to our website. There's a button there you can push that says sign up for emails. And each and every Friday, I send out an email that shares all that's going on here at Calvary in our life of faith together. Uh, if you're gathered together today with friends and family and you want to keep the conversation going, we have out on our website also a discussion guide. Or maybe you want to celebrate communion together. We have some resources there just for you. Head on out to calvaryalec.org to find all those resources. Hey, we want to help you get ready for Christmas. And if you have students around your house, we have a very special event coming up on November 22nd. Everybody. Hey gang, hey. it is time to start thinking about Christmas. It is. Can you believe that? Oh, oh my, my goodness. <laughs> you know, this whole year has been a roller coaster of things that are good and things that are bad. And my so guess true. is that this Christmas season is going to be just kind of like that. Kind of like this. Now, this year has had a lot of feelings, both oh, good and both bad. Like, good, school's on break, bad, there's a pandemic. Good, we're back in school, bad, we're not back in school. Maybe maybe that's both good and bad, I don't know. So true, so true. And students, here's what I know. Maybe you don't admit this, but you've had a lot of feelings this year. This has been one roller coaster of a year. And here's what I also know, for parents, parents, we have had we have. a lot of feelings. <laughs> And so as we process those feelings and get ready for this Christmas, we want to gather together with all of you on November 22nd at 6 o'clock. We're going to gather online and we're going to get ready for what we know is going to be an upside down, inside out, backwards Christmas. <laughs> That's so true. When you sign up to join us for this online event, you're going to get a box like this delivered to your door. And inside this box are experiments and craft projects, conversation cards, and a lot of other tools to be able to help equip you to be able to talk about why sometimes a life that follows Jesus is exactly that upside down, inside out, and backwards, and backwards. just like it was at the very first Christmas. So true. So students, Families, would you do this for me? Right now, would you go to our website, calvaryalec.org, and there sign up for, to join us for our event on November 22nd at 6 o'clock. It's called Getting Ready for an Upside Down, Inside Out, out backwards, backwards Christmas. Hey, folks, we love you all. We'll see you soon. Get signed up today, students. We'd love to have you tune in with your family as we get ready for Christmas. The second thing we invite you to do, folks, is to join us for a night of worship on December 4th. We all love Christmas music. In fact, I would say that when church is over on Sunday morning, people don't have the words of the sermon rattling around in their head. More often than not, they have songs. Songs speak to us. And so we're going to have a Christmas night of worship coming up on November 4th. There's more information to come. 
And last but not least, before we close today, I want to let you know all about a new initiative Calvary is undertaking to help churches in outstate Minnesota and beyond. Hello everybody, Pastor Hans here, and I am here along with Maddie Elliott, who is Calvary's minister out at Westmo Lutheran Church in rural Brandon. And we're here together because Calvary is launching a new initiative that is really, really exciting that we hope will address something going on in churches in outstate Minnesota and beyond. Yeah, so it might be something that you are unaware of, but we are in a time where there is a large shortage of mm -hmm. pastors. And uh, for every two pastors that is retiring from ministry, there's only one pastor mm -hmm. preparing to take a call in a church. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes our more rural congregations are hit harder with this shortage than some of those that find themselves in more urban Very areas. True. And in situations where a rural church is able to find a pastor, that pastor works in that church often all alone. And so that pastor often feels isolated, they feel stretched thin, they feel ill-equipped to handle the unique challenges, not only of rural ministry, but also just ministry today. Yeah, and COVID-19 has really exacerbated this issue. So one church that was experiencing a bit of uncertainty was West Mo Lutheran Church outside of Brandon where you serve. We today, uh, with Maddie's help, we share staff with them. We share resources. We share technology. We share some of our kid, student, and adult curriculum, as well as our philosophy of ministry. Yeah, it's been a really vibrant partnership. And so we sat down with some folks at Westmo and here's what they have to say about what's been going on. I am Catlin Martin. I'm married to Jason Martin. <laughs> my grandparents on my um, mom's side um, were lifelongers. Um, and then my parents started going here. They've been here long, they, I don't know, they got married in the church here and such like that. So, and then um, I've been here all my life too. So I'm Ron Sletto and this is my wife Annette and we're from basically the Brandon area and have a business in Alexandria and my wife works with me and tells me what to do I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> you know Westmore was a good old church where they, everybody steps up and does their thing. And you come here and you see all your friends and neighbors and stuff and you know everybody pretty much and, and if somebody's missing on Sunday kind of like we call and say are you okay you know. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of a comical thing. It's family. I mean, we we love each other like family. We don't have the fancy stuff, but we we feel Christ. Our pastor that we had at, I'd say, two years ago or so, decided uh, that she was going to move on. Um, so we were in need for another pastor. Westmo wasn't probably going to be able to start a call all by ourselves. We're looking for a pastor and I think we have to be 100 members or something and X number of dollars that we'd have to pay them and we just probably couldn't meet that. It's, it's tough for like even like a small business to make it nowadays. It's the same thing with a church. There's not many little churches left like this and that's a shame because there's history. We got in touch um, with you guys and then it worked out just going from there, and it took a little while. Uh, I told myself in the beginning that I'm gonna keep an open mind. A lot of it to do with um, technology, um, different ways of going at, well, at the time, we didn't know we were gonna be in a pandemic, so we're gonna be doing all the stuff online. Um, but music, uh, there was so much more that a bigger church than what we had um, bring to our table. Well, with the Calvary, you guys do like the Daily Dose and all of those things are available whenever you have time to just sit down and watch it. So I think that's a really good option for everybody. And even if you're not directly in the area, like I know there's people from our congregation who moved to Florida that they can still see what's going on in the church and such. The kids, um, there's a lot more uh, things for them too, to do, uh, with a bigger church also and stuff like that. So we thought that was gonna be more appealing for our kids to be more involved. Um, and like it. I think bringing new ideas to church, you know, rather than being stale. Um, even with like the vacation Bible school that we did, it was good to have other people's input and like see what they could 
offer. Well, I just think it is what we need to do. It, it gives old people, and I never understood it before, such hope in the future. When you see when you see parents bringing their children, it's just like, wow. If we've ever needed a church, now is the time. I don't think without you guys, we could have handled the online stuff is very good. And we started doing some of it, but it was very stressful on a couple members, I think, on our end of it and stuff, and on your end to help us and kind of guide us, and then you have the people that do it the right way. Um, really helped out, I think. We, we can't do it on our own. We know that. The theory is you surround yourself with good people. It's something in the back of their mind they want to try. I would say definitely have to give it a whirl. You have to be open. We really appreciate you. We really do. Folks, we know the realities that so many churches are facing today. And we also know the difference that people like Maddie and our partnership with Wes Mo has made in the life of that church. And so Calvary is embarking on a really unique project, a unique initiative. We're calling it the Calvary Partner Network. Yes, we have a deep desire to help churches like Westmo thrive. Mm -hmm. We know by creating a network of churches together, we can walk with them and we can use the blessings that we have been blessed with to help churches mm -hmm. thrive. And here's the exciting news. This is really, really exciting. We are able to do all of this because of a unique grant that Calvary was awarded by the Lilly Endowment of Indianapolis, Indiana. The Lilly Endowment has a great concern for helping congregations thrive. And so over this last year, they have awarded $93 million in the form of 92 grants awarded to colleges, universities, denominations, faith-based organizations. And folks, guess what? Calvary was awarded a grant that we are able to use to invest in rural congregations over the course of the next five years. And the total of that grant that we were awarded was $997,000. I can hardly believe it. Yes, God is so, so good. God is so good. So likely you may have questions, what's this all about? Or maybe you know somebody who attends a church that could benefit from a partnership like this. If that's you, please head out to the partner website, which is calvarypartners.org. Again, it's calvarypartners.org. Folks, it's so great to be with you. Have a good one. Folks, as we close today, a huge thank you. Thank you for your generosity that allows us to do all that we do here at Calvary, touching the lives of students and their families, touching the lives of those who are struggling during this unique time. It allows us to be a church that continues even during these COVID days. And so we say thank you for your generosity. You can see on the screen all the ways that you can make your offering today, whether that be heading out to our website, calvaryalec.org and hit the give button. You can text as the instructions show on the screen, follow the instructions that are texted back to you. Or if you simply want to write a check, you can send it to the church office at the address shown on the screen. Or if you're not quite sure how to make your gift, feel free to give us a call in the office. We'd love to help you live the generous life that God calls people like you and me to. Folks, thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you next week.